Mac Voices is supported by Raycon, the makers of quality earbuds. Get 15% off your order at buyraycon.com slash macvoices. Welcome to Mac Voices. This is the talk of the Apple community, and I'm Chuck Joyner. Folks, the Silicon Valley Mac user group invited Adam Angst and I to talk to them about the WWDC announcements now that a few weeks have passed and we have a little more perspective on it. And this is the first part of that conversation. I did want to make you aware, though, that what you're going to see is a little bit different and maybe sound a little bit different because we were using WebEx to record. And so we took their recording. We've done with it what we can. Um, the audio is pretty good. So if you're listening to audio, you probably won't notice much, if any, difference. But if you're watching the video, you're likely to see some out of sync video. Uh, the frame rates change. The, the audio stays pretty constant, but the frame rates change. And so for a little while, our mouths will go out of sync with the audio, and there's nothing we could do about it. We've adjusted as much as possible, but sometimes it's just not easy or possible to sync everything back up. So if you see it, I want to make sure you know that we weren't slacking. It was just one of those technical things. So let's get to uh, our conversation with Adam and SV Mug. Folks, I'm privileged to have with me tonight Adam Angst of Tidbits. Adam, welcome. It's good to see you. Thanks for having me, Chuck. That's always nice, and uh, especially when we're at 10 p.m. on a Monday night when I'm a little fried. <laughs> well, and we're also both very honored because we are with the Silicon Macintosh user group um, out of California, and they ask us to speak to them virtually via WebEx tonight. So what the, the folks after the fact may see may look a little different, and that's because we're using WebEx tonight. So, but but Silicon Mac, thank you so much for having us. We really appreciate it. It's very nice of you. To so ask. this is this is SV Mug Silicon Valley, and they're having us. Silicon Valley, they're coming, yes, coming yes. all the way to the East Coast to pick up something. Come on, there's got to be someone in Silicon Valley. I I think they're desperate for speakers. Yeah. Today, <laughs> clearly, <so>. clearly. <laughs> So they asked us to talk a little bit about WWDC and the announcements that happened there. And I always kind of enjoy these that have these discussions that happen three, four weeks after the fact, because we sort of are over that giddy, you know, oh, my God, I can't wait to get my hands on it. And we've had a little time to think about it and ascertain what's important, maybe what wasn't. Um, so I know where I want to start, but I'm going to ask you, Adam, to, to take us out first. What do you think were the was the important most important thing or the most important things announced? Oh, for me, it, it has to be Apple Silicon. That okay. you know, a, the fact that Apple is going to be going through a you know a, a third processor switch uh, from obviously Intel chips to Apple's own chips, which are ARM based and probably I mean they're going to be Mac specific, but they're clearly going to be based on the same kind of architecture as is used for the iPad and the iPhone. Um, that's that's just huge um and it, well i shouldn't say that it's huge in some ways and it would be completely unnecessary in others you know that users won't see a th in some ways won't see a thing it'll just be a mac it'll keep working okay we got a little cross talk but that's okay ah jose apparently is Hello, Jose. Oh. Welcome. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> yes. um, so yeah. So any of it. So so Apple Silicon's that my is is my vote for you know the big thing that is really going to be, as it on the one hand changing everything and hopefully changing nothing. You know that uh, you know for as Mac users, hopefully we'll just be able to keep being Mac users. I'm, I'm a little surprised and I'm really pleased because we both agree that that's the big story. <laughs> Oh, come on. We always agree now. <laughs> well, we don't always agree, but, you know, I guess the reason I'm just a little surprised is, and not surprised, that's not right, but it's one of those things that is quite a bit down the road. I mean, the earliest we're hearing about this possibly affecting any end user is the very end of the year. And yeah. the rumors are rampant about which machine is going to be the first to get the Apple Silicon. And, you know, I, who knows? But, you know, yeah. it's one of those things that, I, I guess from my standpoint, I feel like this is one more step in Apple's goal to control its own destiny. Because we've, we've had a number of Mac models in the past that have not, we have not seen refreshes. And a lot of the reasons given, excuses given, were that the Intel chips that they wanted just weren't up to, up to 
to where they needed to be or weren't available yet. Yeah, and that's a really big deal. And I actually would uh, would say that I'm not too I'm not particularly perturbed that the end of the year is when they're talking about this because the fact is nothing talked about at WWC is going to ship until September at the earliest. So. You know, I mean, we've been doing this for a long time. I mean, I've been publishing tidbits for 30 years. Um, another couple of months, yeah, whatever. <laughs> I can wait. <laughs> it'll come around. Uh, it'll come around. It'll happen. And, you know, I'm, I'm not too perturbed about that. It's, but, you know, you're, you're right that there have been a few models, iMac Pro, um, certainly the Mac Pro, and you know, before the current incarnation, um, iMac currently has just been sitting and sitting um, where, you know, we don't really know why Apple hasn't updated them, but, you know, and Apple's not going to badmouth a partner until they, you know, well, they're probably never going to badmouth a partner. Apple's usually pretty good about that. But at the same time, you have to believe that there's some pretty unhappy people inside Apple if they can't get Intel to do what they want. And Apple's a big enough company that they don't have to put up with it anymore. You know, they... They're going to be they're going to be you know, masters of their own destiny even more so and you know that's a nice way to put it um, the other way you could put it is Apple's a con, you know a control freak company and they need to have have their, their fingers on the pulse of everything they do which is sort of a pretty fair assessment I think that's yep. that's sort of generally known <laughs> yeah a little control freakery there <laughs> yeah yeah I, and, and I find it's kind of ironic because. I kind of remember when um, the, the CEO of Intel came out on the bunny suit at Mac. Paolo Tolini. Thank you. I couldn't. I wasn't sure yeah. who, who it was, but he came out, and there was kind of a mixed reaction that you know, okay, this at one time Intel was not exactly seen as the enemy, but maybe as just the the other side of the fence. Well, they they were. I mean, you know, there was a reason why it was called Wintel. You know, that it was Windows and Intel on you know, Windows on Intel chips, and that was the alternative. But you know, when Apple switched from the Motorola or from the Power PCs to uh, to Intel chips, they did so because they needed the performance. PowerPC just wasn't providing a particularly performance per watt. And uh, and so, you know, when you look at that, you can see, you for instance, we never had a PowerBook G5. There wasn't one. And there was a reason for it. And that was the power per watt problem. That you could, I mean, there were G5s. They were powerful. And that was not the issue. The problem was that you couldn't get one that would actually hold a battery charge for any amount of time. And so, you know, so this, that was a big deal. And so I think it's in many ways exactly the same story all over again, that Apple wants chips that are going to give them the most power for the, <laughs> the most CPU power for the least battery power. And that is something which Apple now has a tremendous amount of in-house knowledge and skill in doing because they've been doing it for the iPad and the iPhone for years now. And every now and then they talk about like this, this, you know, the performance levels of, you know, one of their chips and it's really pretty impressive. Um, you know, it's, they're not quite as comparable to Intel stuff as, as they might be because Apple's doing a, well, a lot of what Apple's doing is custom to Apple's operating systems. They're making custom chips for exactly what they want them to do, which is brilliant on their part, of course. And it's something they've never been able to do on the Mac, where they're basically stuck with stock Intel chips. And I have to admit that Jeff Gammon had to point out to me that Apple's been doing this already with the iPhones and iPads. I, I had not thought about it exactly that way. So you're right. They, they sort of snuck it in under the radar on us that they've been gathering up all this information about usage and performance with a, a, a sort of a different platform, but not completely and, and certainly different enough to have it make a, a significant difference. Right. And very much not a different platform, really. You know, that, that all of Apple's operating systems use the same kernel. Um, and, and you can even see this. It was just, I forget which, uh, exactly what version number was. One of the cyclists, one or two releases ago, where Apple did this quick bug fix release and had to update the entire set of operating systems because they all had this particular security flaw. And so, I mean, that more so than anything else just showed how all their operating systems have the same core. And, 
you know, when, when you look at what you do with a custom silicon is that you can have these custom cores. So, you know, we talk about a multi-core processor. Well, you know, that's all fine and nice, but when they don't have to be the same cores. So you've got multi-cores, you can make different ones for different purposes. And so Apple started doing this already with the iPad Pro, um, where they have, what do they call them? Uh, performance and efficiency cores, although as other people call them, fast cores and slow cores. And, and basically, for something that needs the CPU power, you task the fast cores. For something that doesn't need the CPU power at all, you task the slow cores, which are going to use much less battery. And and similarly, they started doing the you know the neural engines and the motion coprocessors, and they're doing all these really specific extra things that do precisely what in this case iOS or iPadOS want. And macOS is no different. That there are you know custom encryption things that it does and custom machine learning things that it does. And if you can de design your own hardware your software suddenly gets a is a big win you know it's it's just like it's it's going to be running faster than you could possibly get it running on off the shelf hardware We're going to be building that hardware as you said specifically for what you want to do so if if you're not picking on anybody but if you're intel you're trying to serve a lot of customers if yeah. you're apple you're only serving yourself as the customer so you're building, you're, 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 you're cutting that suit to exactly your measurements and nobody well, and, else's. And there's two other sides to it, too. Yes, Intel is serving many customers, and let's face it, Macs may be doing well, but they're still a small percentage of the overall PC market. So, yeah, Intel, I'm sure, is more than happy to try to do things to make Apple happy. You know, they want to keep a customer, and I'm sure they were trying. But the fact is, is that in, Apple is still you know, call it 10% of their market. I mean, I don't know if that's actually true or not, but it's certainly, you know, it's certainly no much, not going to be much more than that given Apple's overall market share. So, so that's one thing. Second thing is that Apple no longer has to pay Intel. Chips are high margin um, products. So Apple was paying a fair amount for those chips, which don't cost that much to make. And so now Apple can go to Samsung and um, TCMC, I think it is, Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Corporation, which are the two companies that do, um, they, they basically are independent fabs. So they will make chips on spec for you. Um, you tell them what to do, they give you a chip. Much cheaper to do that than to pay Intel to do it. Intel has their own fabs and has a hefty markup. So Apple's also in a situation where, let's face it, you know, the gro Apple's financial growth is slowing and they're trying to find more revenue wherever they can. This has got to be a good place to get more revenue. Suddenly, if you can make an extra, you know, 30 or 50 or $100 per Macintosh just by switching the CPU out, that's, a, that's just free money. Okay, so I'm going to take this two ways. The first one is is internal. Does this lend any credence to the fact or to excuse me not the fact it's not a fact <laughs> the to, speculation to the, that the speculation that the two operating systems or the three operating systems ios ipad os and mac os are converging well put it this way apple always says no and I think that's a fair statement. I actually um, uh, I heard an interview with Greg Joswiak, um, who's a high-end high -end, uh, marketing guy uh, um, at Apple, and he made the very simple point that Apple has two markets in the iPad and, and the Macintosh. And why would they get rid of one of them? Right? I mean, if you've got two profitable business lines, it has to be somehow incredibly worthwhile if you're going to merge them and then only have one business line. So it just seems unlikely from that standpoint alone that you know what you're doing with a Mac Pro or an iMac even is really different from what you're doing with an iPad. So if you merge them, unless you're going to somehow come up with devices that completely span the entire range from the lowest end iPad to the highest end Mac, you've just cannibalized your own sales. That doesn't make any sense. So, so from that standpoint, doesn't make sense. Secondly, you know, 
No, not to say that it couldn't happen, but at the moment, you can't develop software for real on an iPad. So if you want to write iPad software or iPhone software, you need a Mac to do it. And it really doesn't seem that Apple is likely to be changing what they do to develop all of their code um, without having something different. And, I mean, let's face it, as snazzy as the iPads are, 12.9 inches is a pretty tiddly little screen. I mean, I'm sitting here with a 27-inch iMac and a 27-inch Thunderbolt display, and let me tell you, every Apple developer is running on something big like that. They're not working on 12-inch, you know, 13-inch MacBook Pro. That's, developers don't use 13-inch MacBook Pros as their primary development machine. That would be dumb because small screen, slow processor. They want to throw as much power as they can at that kind of task. So, no, I don't see this as being a merging. That's it. When you look at the interface of Big Sur and of iPad OS 14 in particular, they're a lot closer than they used to be. But I would actually argue that iPad OS is becoming more like Mac OS than the other way around. That suddenly, oh, iPad OS is getting sidebars, and oh, it's getting a menu bar in certain cases, and you know, all this stuff, you know, it got the dock. You know, that what they're discovering is is that the iPad really is more like a Mac than it is like an iPhone. It started out like an iPhone, right? Remember the original iPad and we had those the scaled up iPhone apps which look truly horsey? Um and and Apple keeps working to make that better in iPad OS and they actually even renamed it iPad OS, you know, thirteen, of course. But the fact is is that I think we, you know, we are seeing them get closer and closer because Apple wants a unified user experience across its entire platform. And some of that is obvious stuff, like every device will have a control center, right? That's going to happen. You know, you've got it from your watch, you've got it on the Apple TV now, you've got it on the iPhone, the iPad, and we're going to have it in the Mac and Big Sur. So, you know, that's the kind of thing where they're going for common approach across the entire the entire ecosystem. Um, and, you know, frankly, you know, people have talked about how Big Sur, the interface is a little bit wider and more, um, uh, more amenable to a touch interface. I wouldn't surprise me one bit. Every time I use the iPad Pro heavily for a while and then switch to my MacBook, I want to touch the screen. Yeah, you know, so I I could easily see Apple coming up with a touchscreen, lap, particularly laptop, um, a little less so with a with a desktop. But uh, um, that's not uh, that's not too much of a stretch. But it would still be a Mac. It would just be have that as an as an alternative input mechanism. Today's edition of Mac Voices is supported by Raycon, the makers of quality earbuds. Raycon makes earbuds, but not just any earbuds. I'm notoriously difficult to fit when it comes to earbuds, so when Raycon sent me a pair of their everyday E25s, I admit I was a bit skeptical. But after trying three different sized tips that come with them, I found the one that comfortably fit my ears. Surprise! But earbuds are no good if they don't sound good. And these sound good. Really good. The bass is full and rich without being overpowering and muddy. The highs were nice and bright. They just sound good. Next is the comfort test. Yes, they fit, but how long can I wear them and have them still feel good? I put them in when I started my work day and didn't take them out until late afternoon, and most of that time I forgot I was wearing them. So comfort checked off as a win too. There's a lot more to tell you about these earbuds, and I will. Things like easy Bluetooth pairing, six hours of playtime, and more. So how about getting past those wired earphones that are so last decade and step up to the quality earbuds that start at about half the price of other premium wireless earbuds on the market, the earbuds that celebrities like Melissa Etheridge are obsessed with. And it gets even better. Now's the time to get the latest and greatest from Raycon. Get 15% off your order at buyraycon.com slash macvoices. That's buyraycon.com slash macvoices for 15% off Raycon wireless earbuds. Buyraycon.com slash macvoices. Thanks to Raycon for their support of Mac Voices. Wow. That's the one that's the one I was with you right up to that point. <laughs> and then I lost you, yes. <laughs> well, you didn't you didn't lose me. It's just I, I'm I just don't understand it. I have yet to have the desire to touch 
any screen when I'm using my Macintosh. In fact, I actively don't want to touch it because of the smudging issue. Um, and so, and and, okay. and yet, and and yet, I have Sidecar over on this on this iPad right here. And so, but that's the iPad, and that is a touch interface. Yeah, I think you're. Just, I think I think it's just what you're feeling used to. And the fact is, is that there are some things, and it, and and what I find is interesting is that, um, and, and it really is for me when I switch back and forth quickly. Yeah, you know, it's like I've just been working on the iPad Pro for an hour or two, and then I open the MacBook for some reason, and a dialogue comes up. How come I can't can't t I can't tap okay? Yeah, I'm not saying I want to like do text selection with my finger. That's way worse than on a trackpad or arrow keys. Um, you know, we've seen that. There's just some things that don't work as well via touch, and Apple's acknowledged that in part by Brent coming up with a Magic Keyboard for iPad Pro, which has a trackpad, and you know, Logitech's coming up with them for the other devices, uh, the older iPads, and things like that. So, yeah, there's some things which a trackpad is, or arrow keys are just better for, but there's some things that touch is just better for. It really is. And, and you know, I don't think, I think it's one of those situations where you can't really predict what anyone's going to think. But again, we have decades of experience with mice and trackpads and keyboards. Imagine someone who's, you know, six, seven, eight right now and has grown up with touch and they're going to move to, you know, need to have more powerful software, need to do development or whatever it is. They're going to, like, they're just going to be befuddled. Why can't I touch the screen? I've been touching screens my entire life. Why can't I touch the screen on this Mac? You know, I just, just, just right there. I just want to, I just want to touch it once. And, you know, I don't need to do a lot. I just need to touch it right there. And it can't. You know, and I mean, it's fascinating. I, my son's 21 and, um, and you know he he has different issues, um, but uh, uh, mostly involving installing Ubuntu and stuff. But uh, but it, it, he's just there are things where he's just like, how come Apple doesn't? And I'm like, cause they don't. You know, like I've we've seen this for years and years. You know, something big has to change because Apple just doesn't do things. And touch on a Mac has been one of those things. I mean, Steve Jobs said it. You know, when they introduced like we don't think people want to touch the, touch the Mac. And, um, and, but, you know, I, I don't know how many years ago that was offhand. I'm guessing it was 2010. So I'm guessing it was 10 years ago when they introduced the iPad. And, um, but I'm guessing that that will change in the next five years. You know, might not be the first, it might, might not be the first Apple Silicon Max, or it might be, I don't know. Um, just, it seems inviting with that, uh, with that uh, new Big Sur interface. But, you know, I just have to assume they're, they're, they're thinking about it. Well, and if if we are in an era where we're going through the, going to go through the change, and they've said it's going to be a two year transition, it might very well be that the the uh, the new Max with the Apple Silicon will have that touch, touch interface, or at least it, the ability to turn it on at some point, whether it's Big Sur or the next. OS. Right, right, and I mean, and if you think about it, in some ways, okay, so Apple's introducing these new Apple Silicon Macs, and there's. One thing that has to be true of them, I believe, is they have to have better performance. So why would you buy a Mac? You know, if you're if you're faced with an Apple Silicon Mac and an Intel Mac, um, and the, and they have the same level of performance, then it's just like a weird toss-up. But what happened with the Intel switch was the Intel-based Macs were just better. You're like, okay, I I want that because it's got so much better performance for the for the price or for the battery life or for whatever, and so you know, so I think they have to have better performance. But something like, oh, the Apple Silicon MacBook Pros or whatever they end up being called, yeah, also have a touch screen. All well, suddenly, that's kind of cool, right? And it's entirely possible that you know that's one of those things that they couldn't actually do well before without their own custom chips, you know, that to make the performance and the responsiveness and all that, you know, I mean, let's face it, touch screens on, on laptops, not new. Um, I mean, they had them for years and years and years. Um, but, you know, Apple makes a really big deal about the responsiveness and the accuracy of the touch screen on the iPads and the iPhones, and particularly when you start using the Apple Pencil. So, so, you know, and, and I mean, this is going a bit further afield, but, you know, if you were to have, if Apple were to make one of those div um, uh, kind of laptops, which folds open, so you get like just a, just a, a screen and you can write on it with a pencil and then you can fold it the other way and get a keyboard, not saying they would do that, but 
suddenly you could see that happening more reasonably if they had a touch interface for Mac OS. Where they, whereas they wouldn't have done it before because it made no sense before. Right. Okay, so that was the first angle. Now the, here comes the second angle. Is this, because we were just looking inward, now let's, let's look outward. Does Apple moving to the ARM architecture, do you think this is an industry-leading thing? Do you think there's going to be, assuming that we, we see the performance kick that we expect to, do you think this is going to drag some of the uh, the, uh, the non-Apple users to, excuse me, non-Apple manufacturers to start looking at ARM? No, I don't. Um, I, I I don't see that as, as being an issue because, I mean, most of those companies don't have the kind of chip you know, manufacturing, chip, or not manufacturing, but chip design skills. So, I mean, it works for Apple because Apple's been doing it for years and they know how to do it. They know how to make, you know, design them and how to manufacture them. They've been doing this, you know, at high volume. I mean, they sell way more iPhones and iPads than they sell Macs. So, I mean, in some ways, the Mac is easy, right? You know, that they, 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 they don't have to do, you know, you know, 50 million of them off, off the bat. Um, so, so no, I don't, I don't really see that. Plus, um, Windows for ARM exists, but it's kind of funky, and it doesn't have great compatibility um, situations. So drivers don't work. Various other kind of protected software doesn't work. Um, I think virtualization is an issue. Um, you can actually go look at it you know, on the Microsoft Windows for ARM site. They have this list of stuff that doesn't work, which is not really a great selling point. Um, and um, so, you know, and then there's, you know, obviously Linux, vari various variants of Linux for ARM, but those aren't ever going to be mainstream kind of things. Chromebooks, I don't know, Chrome OS feels to me they would, they, you know, it's probably not worth it because that's more of a commodity market. So they're going to probably go for what's cheapest and, you know, probably like AMD uh, low-end chips in there. So, no, I don't see this as, as changing it. And it wouldn't matter. Right, it's not ARM is not a is not a co is not a unified thing. So, you know, ARM is a is a license. You license it um, from ARM, or if you're like Apple, you design your own and license some of the intellectual property. And I don't actually know what Apple's situation was. They used to actually be a major stakeholder um, in ARM, and I think that got sold at some point, but I haven't been able to quite trace it all down. So so Apple may even have a different situation where they may have a perpetual license or whatever because of their previous investment. Um, but uh, but yeah, it's not, you know, it isn't, it isn't this, it isn't like Intel and AMD being two companies which are actually competing, um, you know, that, uh, that ARM is of a different thing. Before we leave this subject, the, the Maybe the most important question of all. Is it silicon or silicon? Apple silicon. Apple silicon or apple silicon? Silicon yep. Valley or apple silicon? And keep in mind, we're talking to the Silicon Valley app, uh, Macintosh user group. I, 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 that's a good question. I know it's not silicone because that would be implants. So yes, uh, yeah, yeah, we're, we're not, not going there yet. But... Um, I got a dozen jokes, and I'm just not going to use them. <laughs> Come on, Chuck. I'm resisting. I'm, I'm resisting the touch interface joke, and I'm not going to use it. Um, oops. Um, so, uh, so in any event, um, I don't know. I, I have to go back and listen to what the Apple was pronouncing it at, at the WWDC keynote. That's the good question. I mean, when in doubt, go listen to the horse's mouth. Yeah. <laughs> good boy. Good boy. <laughs> so. We're going to take a break here and see if anyone has any questions uh, before we start turning to more user-facing things. So if anyone wants to turn on their mics and ask a quick question, by all means. And if not, we'll just keep on going. What could go wrong? So with the okay. question on separating the OSs, um, if you've got essentially unified icons, unified interfaces, like the only real difference between an iPhone and iPad and a Mac is that you can touch the screen or not touch the screen, mm. where then is the actual, you know, what other difference is there that the Mac OS and the iOS have as a separating thing? It's the huge layer of middle stuff, right? So you've got the core stuff, which is pretty similar between 
watch OS and TV OS and iOS and iPad OS and Mac OS and all that, right? The Darwin kernel and everything. But what comes above that is this huge layer of Mac stuff. So, I mean, that's sort of the whole point. Um, Apple keeps doing uh, their Swift UI and Mac, and Mac Catalyst of you can get an iPad, um, you can write and make, make it easy to port an iPad app to the Mac, but you still get kind of a weak Mac app. I mean, like all of the Catalyst apps that, that Apple's have done, Apple has done have been really pretty lame. Um, and similarly, you'll be able to run iOS and iPadOS software on a Mac running Big Sur on Apple Silicon, but they're not going to they're going to be an op i mean it's not going to be a mac app and so if you want to do serious mac stuff you're going to be accessing all those apis um that are mac only and so you know you're not going to see the full-fledged photoshop or or final cut pro or things like that um being done with one set of cross-platform software because Every time you do that kind of stuff, it just you don't end up with something that's any good on any of the platforms. So we'll start. We'll I think we'll keep seeing the smaller, more focused apps on the iPad, and the really big, serious stuff that again is able to take on all this extra hardware. I mean, iPads and iPhones don't really do peripherals real well. Um, so you know, if you want to, you want to throw in extra, you know, video cards. You want to have a lot of hard drives attached. You want to have, you know, like I've got three or four microphones attached to my Mac. That's all Mac stuff. You know, the iPad's not going to be able to do that easily. And so um, we shouldn't we shouldn't get confused that just because they're going to look the same, that the same capabilities. Macs will have a whole lot more capabilities. Because they're just, you know, more significant machines. I mean, even like if you go up to particularly to the Mac Pro, where you've got all these slots and extra extra cards you can put in and things like that, you know, completely different beast um, at that level. And I'd be just, I hope that doesn't happen, at least not too soon, because right now you can take things that um, you can get third party applications that don't come through the App Store, that don't follow all of Apple's guidelines if you give them the right permissions to do so. And as opposed to something on the iPad or iPhone, where the only way to get something non-Apple approved or non-Apple, what's the word I want? Um, fil not filtered, but yeah, I approved. Um, approved, yeah. On there is, is to jailbreak the, the and, and right. compromise the integrity of the device, which always scares me. I, I would not... Uh, I have never seen, do it. I, I, I have yet to see the utility that makes me want to jailbreak anything I have. And I, yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. And uh, and I don't see that changing. That the the simple fact is, particularly as a development machine, you know, that's where you write your software on the Mac. You get Xcode for the Mac. And so, if, as long as you're going to be able to develop, you need to be able to run anything you want without having Apple approve it in some way, shape, or form. And, you know, there's too much custom software, too much software that's used by, you know, one, one person, one company, one department, one field, that is just never going to be the sort of thing that can go through Apple and, and, and meet all of its requirements. I mean, my favorite example, the, the, the piece of software that I wouldn't be caught dead with on, without on a Mac is Keyboard Maestro. So, you know, it's a macro utility. It has to be able to touch everything in sight to be able to automate whatever task you want. And Apple's never going to approve that for the App Store um, in the sandboxing world. And so that kind of software never going to appear on iOS either, iPadOS. Same thing. And so, you know, as long as, um, as, long as you know, we are in a conceivable state where people are going to be writing their own software and wanting to do things that Apple hasn't ever anticipated, then, you know, we're going to need a Mac to do that on. So, yeah, I really don't worry about Macs going away, you know, at least in the, you know, 10 to 20 year frame, you know, time frame. I mean, who knows after, you know, after 10 years, but certainly five to 10 years, no, there's going to be Macs the entire time. That wraps up the first part of our conversation with Silicon Valley Mac User Group and Adam Angst. We'll have more in the second edition where we start to get into iOS 14 and the iPhone and what the announcements mean there. So until the next time, and as always, thanks for watching.
Visit macvoices.com for show notes and to connect with Chuck on social media. Get involved in our Facebook group or like our Facebook page and get more out of your Apple tech with Mac Voices Magazine, free on Flipboard and on the web. And if you find value in it all, consider supporting us through either our Patreon campaign at patreon.com slash macvoices or by making a one-time donation via the PayPal link on our front page and in the show notes of each episode. You will join these fine people who help bring you Mac Voices. Advertising handled by Backbeat Media at backbeatmedia.com. Bandwidth provided by Cashfly at cashfly.com.